Good morning. I'm so glad to see you. I'm Pastor Christine Ford, and along with Pastor Bill Eves, we'd like to welcome you to online worship with White Bear Lake United Methodist Church. It is so good that we are together today. It is the vision of our church to provide nourishment for the hungers of life. We trust that as we worship together, no matter where we are in the world, that God moves among us, nourishing us in heart, in mind, in spirit, and in soul. And that gives us strength and fortitude, allows us to go about into the world in our week, to be light and salt, and to nourish the hungers we encounter around us. For the end part of our summer, we are exploring a sermon series that we've called Banned Books of the Bible. We are taking a look at some of the lesser known stories, the things we don't typically talk about in church. We're going to explore a bit about why that is and what we can learn from them. So come, let us be in worship together.
Judges 4, 12 through 24. When they told Sisera that Barak, son of Abinoam, had gone up to Mount Tabor, Sisera summoned from Harishath Hagoim to the Kingshaw River all his men and his 900 chariots fitted with iron. Then Deborah said to Barak, Go, this is the day the Lord has given Sisera into your hands. Has not the Lord gone ahead of you? So Barak went down Mount Tabor with 10,000 men following him. At Barak's advance, the Lord routed Sisera and all his chariots and army by the sword. And Sisera got down from his chariot and fled on foot. Barak pursued the chariots and army as far as Harishath Hagoyim, and all Sisera's troops fell by the sword not one man was left. Sisera, meanwhile, fled on foot to the tent of Jael, the wife of Heber the Kenite, because there was an alliance with Jobin, king of Azur, and the family of Heber the Kenite. Jael went out to meet Sisera and said to him, Come, my lord, come right in, don't be afraid. So he entered her tent and she covered him with a blanket. I'm thirsty, he said, please give me some water. She opened a skin of milk, gave him a drink, and covered him up. Stand in the doorway of the tent, he told her. If someone comes by and asks, is anyone there, say no. But Jael, Heber's wife, picked up a tent peg and a hammer and went quietly to him while he lay fast asleep, exhausted. She drove the tent peg through his temple into the ground, and he died. Just then, Barak came by in pursuit of Sisera, and Jael went out to meet him. Come, she said, I will show you the man you're looking for. So he went in with her, and there lay Sisera with the tent peg through his temple, dead. On that day, God subdued Jabin, king of Cana, before the Israelites. And the hand of the Israelites pressed harder and harder against Jabin, king of Cana, until they destroyed him. Will you pray with me? Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your holy sight, O God, my rock and my salvation. Amen. Have you ever wondered how pastors decide what they're going to preach about on Sunday morning? How do we know what to do? Do we hear it in a dream? And the Spirit whisper it into our ear? That would be convenient, but no. Does the bishop send us an email every week and say, Thou shalt be preaching on this? Also, no. There are several ways that one goes about selecting 
how a sermon is shaped. But always, a sermon is informed by, shaped by, and in accordance with scripture. Every week, we read from the Bible. Some weeks we read multiple verses. Some weeks they're long, some weeks they're short. Sometimes they tell a story, but always, 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 there is the presence of scripture in a worship service. And that is the foundation upon which we build the rest of the service. The music, the prayers, and yes, the sermon are all informed from scripture. But how do we even pick that part? Again, it's not a directive from on high, whether it's on high or on high. In the United Methodist Church, we have quite a bit of freedom as pastors, as do other denominations. And so, in the case of our congregation, every couple of months, Pastor Bill and I get together. We have a conversation. We talk about the changing needs of the world, the world broadly and our world here at church. We talk about the things that have inspired us or that we've read recently, the concerns that the congregation has brought to us. We talk about current events. We talk about things that we feel strongly called to bring forth, to bring to the congregation, to all of you. The things that we feel passionate about, that we feel the world needs, and that we feel we need to say. From these conversations, we decide to set a series, a sermon series. These series can be anywhere from maybe three weeks up to eight or nine weeks. It just depends on the season and what the series calls for. The series that we are in the midst of, as I said in the beginning, is called Banned Books of the Bible. We don't often get to talk about the extras, the peripheral stories, the things you don't hear every day and may have never heard of. Are there reasons we've never heard of them? Is it a coincidence? Is it an innocent choice or is there something more sinister lurking behind? We'll see. A lot of churches, our own and many like us, have either the option or the requirement to use a prescribed schedule of verses. In most cases, this is called the lectionary. Might be a word that you're familiar with or that you've heard thrown around and never really understood the context. The lectionary is a schedule of biblical readings. Typically, any given week allows for Old Testament, Newer Testament, and Psalms. The schedule can last either one or three years, and through it, somebody has a path. They have a roadmap for preaching what the church has considered important from the Bible. And the people have access to and exposure to a wide variety of things. This is done to help both pastor and person in the pews. It's done to try to explore a variety of stories and contexts across time and space. And it's designed so that the people get all the messages that they need, all the things that someone has deemed important. Lectionaries in and of themselves are not new. There's evidence of a schedule in the Talmud, a Jewish book of sacred commentaries on the scripture. There, are evident, there is evidence of lectionary use in the early church and ones that evolved throughout time. Typically, they were written, designed, and set by local priests and pastors, and they were used for the specific congregation that they served. In the medieval times, the church began writing official lectionaries 
that were circulated through practicing Catholic congregations, mostly in Western Europe, but in the Orthodox Church as well. This schedule was a one-year walk through the Bible of all the things that the Vatican deemed important enough for people to hear. Medieval lectionaries continued to evolve and change and grow bit by bit, and it was really in the 20th century that what we come to know as a lectionary was born. In the wake of Vatican II, a group of church people called the Consultation on Common Texts was formed. This included representatives of over 20 denominations throughout the Western world, including our own United Methodist Church. I heard recently someone answer a question, well, if it's done in church, it's done through committee. And that's really true. And this is just a brilliant example of it. An ecumenical group of people coming together to form a committee to make something, hopefully for the betterment of the church. In 1994, they published the Revised Common Lectionary, a three-year journey through the Bible, which covered huge tracts of it. And the Revised Common Lectionary is the one most commonly used in mainline Protestant churches today. Like I said, here in the UMC, we have the choice whether we use it or not. Pastor Bill and I tend not to, but we still refer to it. And maybe there will be times where we decide, you know what, let's let the lectionary guide us for a while. It's a great tool and one that will expose you to most of the Bible. But will it expose you to all of the Bible? Unfortunately, no. Every lectionary has left things out. I don't think it would surprise very many people to hear that most of the stories previously omitted were the stories of women. Patriarchy has been a strong presence in Christendom since the beginning. The omission of women has slowly been remedied over the years, and the Revised Common Lectionary includes dozens of stories of powerful women. And it's interesting. Hannah has her baby, Ruth finds her Boaz, Mary sings her Magnificat in the RCL. But what stories are left out still? Today's Bible reading from the book of Judges, the story of Yael, is one of those. If your church, this or any other, were to follow the Revised Common Lectionary to its letter, you would not hear the story of a woman who lured a leader into her tent and drove his tent spike through his head as he slept. Why not? We lift up other stories of women, women who were not necessarily conformists, women who defied the odds in amazing and beautiful ways. But it's interesting that this story, which is one of the most extreme in the Bible, is still omitted, even as we celebrate women like Mary Magdalene or Lydia. There's something unique about a woman taking justice into her own hands and actually taking on the act of killing someone. It's a bold act that required fortitude of gut and will and temperament, as well as physical strength. You ever felt a human skull? Holy cow. And the story tells us that she drove the pike all the way through. This is a woman who embodied so many things that we still today consider masculine. And yet her story is left out. While well, stories such as found in Proverbs, the ones that give instructions for how to be a good wife are allowed to remain. It's a sad thing, and it prevents us from hearing a complete story. 
It lifts up only the parts that the people in power want to be lifted. What can we do about this? Well, in church, like in life, I would encourage you to go right for the source. Just like one might fact, fact check a news organization, you can fact check the church as well. I encourage you to engage in your own Bible study, to see what you think, what you hear, in any story, not just this one. How do you select what you read in the Bible? There are hundreds of guides available to you online. And if you'd like help finding something, drop us a line. We'd be happy to assist. That being said, it's a journey that you can go on yourself. Even in stories that are commonly read, we might emphasize different things. We each have their own perspective our own perspectives, and we will hear things with our unique ears. It's good and right and proper that we bring lots of perspectives to the table. Not just mine, not just any pastor's, but yours too. The way you interact with the Bible is important. Do I recommend tools like the common lec revised Common Lectionary? Yes, absolutely I do. But don't stop there. Take it deeper. Hear the voices that are often silenced. Hear a voice like Yael that cries out, screaming, likely at the top of her lungs. A wild and crazy voice that in very many ways was a savior for the Jewish people. Do not let yourself be limited to how someone else wants you seen. If they can't handle you at your Judges 4, they don't deserve you at your Proverbs 31. May it be so. Amen. Please join me now as we pray together. Good and gracious God, our God and the God of all people, our hearts are full of gratitude for your generous, unconditional love. We thank you for the whole glorious creation, for space expanding into infinity, for stars and planets, sun and moon and the earth, our home. 
We thank you for the gift of life and its amazing diversity and variety, and for the gift of our own lives and the lives of all those we hold dear. Today we thank you for your church, for this community of faith that unites us and proclaims the good news of peace. We give thanks for all those people who through the years have gathered in your name to worship and to serve. And we rejoice in our place, in the worldwide fellowship of your faithful people, stretching across the borders and across the oceans, across languages and cultures, drawn together in Christ, who is our life. We lift up in our hearts the names of all those who deal with the pains and burdens of life today, for the sick and the recovering, for the grieving, for the troubled and the sleepless. We remember those who live in war-torn lands, those whose lives have been upended by wildfire and drought and flood, and those who are denied the rights and freedoms that so many of us take for granted. And dear God, we pray for those closest to us and for ourselves. Give us all patience, hope, and trust in your unfailing love. We offer this prayer and the prayers that remain unspoken in our hearts. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, hear us now as we pray the prayer he taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you for worshiping with us today. If you're local to the White Bear Lake area, we would love to meet you in person sometime. If you're online only or if you're not local, that's fine too. We'd love to be in community with you as well. You can find us on our website, wblumc.org, or on Facebook, on Instagram, or on YouTube. On our website, you'll find information about the life and goings on in our church as well as schedules and ways to connect, reach out, contact info and the like. And now friends, may the peace of Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the power of the Holy Spirit go with you now and always. And amen. <laughs>